Hello and welcome to the live webinar of Tennessee Environmental Council. My name is Monica Pretz. I am the pollinator program leader. Uh, our pollinator program is called Generate Some Buzz. So that's what we are trying to do today because this is Moth Week. So we are talking about moth species of North America. To, we talk about their beauty, their diversity, their life cycles, their habitats. And I would like to introduce you to our panelist and my colleague, Brian Beecham, who is our field volunteer coordinator, no, field operation coordinator or something like that. Sorry about that. <laughs> and also she will talk a little bit about our program just in a few slides to introduce our program to the newcomers for those who have not heard about us and maybe would like to join us we encourage you to join our efforts and we very warmly welcome Jim McCormack the author of the book Gardening for Moth and he will present his beautiful photographs and presentation after Brain's presentation um, I would like to encourage every one of you to raise questions, to use the Q&A uh, in the big bottom of the, your page. You can see Q&A, write your questions there. You can write throughout the presentation. We will answer the questions at the end. And with this, hello, Jim. Hello, Bryn. How are you doing today? Very well. Thank you. Doing well. Just surviving the heat. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So, Bryn, would you like to start, share your screen? I will turn my camera and my um, and mute myself. So all right. it's all yours. All righty, let me turn my camera off. Okay, thanks for joining us today for this webinar. Um, my name is Bryn Beecham. I am the field event coordinator for Tennessee Environmental Council, and um, we're so thankful to have you guys join us and watch Jim's presentation on moths today. Next slide. Uh, Tennessee Environmental Council is a nonprofit organization founded in 1970. Our mission is helping people and communities improve our environment. Our vision is thriving habitats, circular economy, and climate balance in Tennessee. Um, Generate Some Buzz is our pollinator program. Through this program, we are educating others on how to attract, feed, and protect pollinator species, restore and create new pollinator habitat, engage with Tennesseans to form vibrant communities and educate about pollinators. Why are pollinators declining? Um, in the last few decades, we have witnessed major pollinator decline and the loss of thousands of insect species. Uh, there are several reasons behind this decline, such as habitat loss and urbanization. We love our lawns to be very uniform and green all year round. Um, however, lawns are essentially an uh, ecological desert for pollinators. Other reasons behind pollinator decline are the chemicals that we use in our environment, um, such as insecticides, herbicides, fertilizers, and fungicides. These chemicals not only eliminate and kill insects, but affect the whole environment and our own health. Um, the final reason for this collapse is our monoculture agricultural practices, which provide little to no habitat for wildlife species. Uh, we invite you to be part of the solution um, by planting native pollinator habitats, creating urban and suburban gardens that include layers of trees, shrubs, and perennials, um, by changing and supporting regenerative organic agriculture through buying local foods and um, by creating pesticide-free healthy environments in your own home. Um, create your own pollinator garden. Uh, design the shape and size of your garden, remove the sod, add back soil and compost, um, spread the native seeds, uh, preferably if you buy through TEC, that would be awesome. Um, monitor the germination of those seeds, Make sure you remove re uh, returning invasive species. And lastly, 
enjoy your garden, watch it thrive and flourish and um, see all the insects and activity that goes on in your garden. We're here to help you uh, get started at TEC. Uh, we have resources on our website and a whole Facebook group community uh, for support and to share uh, your progress. Um, you can order native seeds through TEC. We have three different seed packets that each provide enough seed to establish 20 square feet of pollinator garden. Our seed packets contain 100% native wildflower and grass seed. Each seed mix consists of 20 plus native species. So um, please visit our website at tectn.org slash generate some buzz, or you can scan the QR code to get started in the program. All righty. Fantastic. Thank uh, you so much, Brian. That was perfect. And um, I would like to give uh, the time now for Jim, but before he does that, I would quickly like to, like to read up something from his book. Um, uh, according to his book, according to the uh, 2018 National Gardening Survey, 77% of U.S. homeowners garden, and gardeners are generally very good at growing plants. The yardscape featuring elements of native flora will skyrocket in value for birds, butterflies, moths, and other animals. And the most important that I would like to say that he says, and I wholeheartedly agree with this, gardeners can be an enormous force for ecological restoration. So we are inviting every one of you to be part of this ecological restoration, to plant native plants, and with that support, our beautiful pollinator species and insects that we are so much needed for a healthy uh, ecosystem. And with this, I would like to give um, you, Jim, the, uh, the possibility to present your beautiful book and your slides and your amazing photography. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica, and thanks, Bren. I appreciate it. I, I trust everything looks good on your end. It looks yeah. good. Yes, looks good. Go okay. Good. Okay. Well, we'll get started. And this talk is only loosely based on this book, which just came out in uh, March of this year. And it, I did it along with my co-author, Chelsea Gottfried, who's also an Ohioan. <clears throat> and there had been no book like this, surprisingly. There's tons of gardening for butterfly type books, but the moths have gotten short shrift. All right. So we did our part to rectify this with this 300 plus page book that's got over 600 photos and lots of other cool stuff, uh, including the introduction, which is fairly lengthy. And that's mostly what I'm going to talk about. Why are moths important? Why should we care? So the book covers a, an admittedly innovative region, which we created because basically in the 10 states shown here or parts thereof, uh, the flora largely remains the same, the plant communities. Jim, can I just, just stop to you for a second? We see your slide and we also see the next slide. Can you maybe- Okay, I know what that problem is. We don't want that, just a second. Um, what about now? Perfect. Yeah, that's great. That's we see one picture now. That's cool. Sorry about that. It's why I always ask. Uh, if it looks good. Anyway, now that we got that solved, so I was talking about the map and the similarity of the plant community within the region. Your state, Tennessee, is just outside of it, but moths don't respect political boundaries. Believe me, a lot of this stuff in our book applies to Tennessee as well. <clears throat> uh, we will see why plants drive moths. Probably a lot of you already know. So this is a quote from the beginning of the book uh, from a Florida entomologist, and he's exactly right. The bottom line is all butterflies are moths. No such thing as butterflies might be going a little far, but it's really all one tribe here. Uh, and there are way more moths, as we shall see, than there are butterflies. 
So I've been on this gardening circuit for a long time speaking, and a lot of times it's in more traditional garden clubs. I'm a native plant person. I spent most of my career as a botanist uh, uh, and focused on native plants, but I, I sometimes talk to groups that aren't maybe as predisposed to natives and other speakers on the slate who are also not. But I've heard things like this so many times, you know, grow what makes you feel good and it's all about you. <laughs> I always have to ask myself, why? Well, it's always all about us, humans, everything. Um, and maybe it's good to get a little out of that mindset, especially with gardening. Here's what humans do. We are masters of destroying habitat, just to put it bluntly, with new developments like this, often named epitaphically for what used to be there, like whispering oaks. There's no oaks there now. <clears throat> uh, in my state especially, one half of Ohio, and this is true that throughout the America's breadbasket, <clears throat> um, Ohio's half agriculture. That gets to 80% or more when you get to Iowa and Illinois. And that's what it looks like. So we've taken these wonderful deciduous forests or prairies. This used to be a prairie in this picture. And, uh, you know, created a triumvirate of plants, three species, basically, corn, bean, and beans, and wheat. And that's really greatly reduced moth diversity and all other animal life as well. This is, and then, you know, at our uh, peak, we build cities like this. And that's my Bear City, Columbus, Ohio, and uh, there's very few moths or anything else to be found once it gets that developed. And the light pollution is very hard on moths too. They're attracted to lights. So, you know, we can all do our little piece like Bryn talked about. This is uh, my front yard. <laughs> I whittle away at the grass trying to, um, you know, get rid of it over time and replace it with native flora and the animal community has responded nicely. There's way more interesting insects now in my yard, which is what I want. My neighbors might not, but um, just from simple little steps like this. <clears throat> so why care about moths? That would be a big question and one I've gotten a lot, you know, uh, like they eat my clothes, they get in my cereal, dried goods and the, impression people have of moths in general is probably not that great. And there's a, I'm going to talk about why that might be, but here's why we should care about them. Their, their connection to native plants is tremendous, uh, huge species diversity. It's really incredible. And this weaves them really tightly into food webs. They're absolutely vital to feed other creatures as well. And they're just cool. If I'm just going to sum up the fourth one, they are really interesting bugs. And we can grow them just like we grow butterflies. So the evolution of the order Lepidopter goes back nearly 200 million years ago. Butterflies are pikers. They diverged off this lineage only about 50 or 50, 60 million years ago. So the moths have been around way, way longer. And they are way more speciose. Um, of the 180,000 species so far described, that's going to get over 200,000 eventually. Uh, yeah, 160,000 are moths, eight times as many moths as butterflies worldwide. That gets even more extreme when you get in northern regions. Uh, farther away from the equator you get, the more moths as compared to butterflies there are. <clears throat> but they have a reputational issue. We need, they have not had the PR agents basically that butterflies have had for a long time. Butterflies, you could fill a warehouse with poetry like that, you know, all very flowery. Um, few, if any, unkind words to be written about butterflies. Everyone likes them. They're much, much better known than their moth counterparts. Uh, it's not hard to figure out why. Um, they fly during the day like this beautiful great spangled fritillary. They're easy to see. They're often very, very pretty. This one, the Painted Lady, they even release at weddings. I mean, no moths are being released at weddings that I know of. So no problems with reputation there. When you get into moths, it changes a lot. This is the poster from The Silence of the Lambs. I know a lot of you saw this movie with Anthony Hopkins. Hannibal the Cannibal he played, very grim movie and a very, well, to them, grim uh, totem that was used. The One of the deaths had hawk moths with that skull in the back of it. It's a real moth. It's a group of moths. 
Um, and that's, that's how Ma's tend to get portrayed. Uh, this is a, a vagrant to your Tennessee and then even Ohio, we get one or a few of them a year. The Mariposa de la Murta, the butterfly of death as it's known in Spanish. And it's this big monstrous bat sized thing that uh, has some superstition around it that's involving death and things like that. And they are kind of creepy looking when you know how to photograph them like that. Closer to my home, this is Mothman on the left. Mothman was this mythical Yeti-like beast that wandered the Ohio River Valley in the late 60s and was implicated in the collapse of the Silver Bridge that went between, between Point Pleasant, West Virginia and Ohio. A lot of fatalities when the bridge collapsed. And it was not Butterfly Man, it was Mothman that somehow is connected to that. Oh, and then on the right is Mothra uh, doing battle with Godzilla from a Japanese sci-fi movie. <clears throat> but they certainly are cute and they're very, very interesting. I'm just gonna show you a little rogues gallery of some really pretty awesome things here. This is a dot-lined white moth and th that is as cuter than any butterfly I've ever seen. Uh, looks like a little, uh, I don't know, a bighorn sheep and a yak or something combined. Look at a caterpillar, it's crazy. We're looking right down a branch, right into the face of the dot line white caterpillar. You, even a sharpest eye bird might not see it. There it is from the side. It's an incredible lichen mimic. The caterpillar phase is as amazing as the moth phase, often more amazing and often much longer lived as well. Here's a buck moth. This is an oak specialist, one of myriad oak specialists. Oaks support more moth species than any other plant genus, um, but that's a male with this huge fern-like antennae, which are loaded with pheromone receptors that he picks up the airborne pheromones, re pheromones released by the female, and that's how he finds her. Tulip tree silk moth. Uh, people really do like the silk moths. This would include the Luna and some of the Cecropia, the more well-known ones. Um, <clears throat> there's what it looks like flat out, big bat sized thing. To be crude about this, the silk moths are really flying gonads. Uh, they don't have any mouth parts. They don't feed. They might live a week. That's it. And their sole purpose is to find a mate. Mate, and if it's female, drop the eggs. It would have lived far longer in that stage. This is the tulip tree silk moth caterpillar, this waxy, cool looking thing. Uh, it's got this close relative though called the Promethea moth. That's another big silk moth. Caterpillars look really, really similar. So do the adults, but look, here's the Promethea moth caterpillar back end. It looks like a unicorn with a smiley face. A lot of these caterpillars are amazingly cool. And as a photographer, you learn to look at them from all angles to find these funny faces and other features. Here's one of our prettiest Sphinx. Sphinx are another popular group of moths that are bigger and easier to see. And that's a hydrangea sphinx, and there's its beautiful little caterpillar. This is a specialist, an extreme specialist. It only eats our, up in my part of the world at least, the only native hydrangea that we have, this species right here. Specialization is extremely common in this world. Here's another specialist, the pawpaw sphinx, that um, is always around pawpaw because that's all this beautiful caterpillar uh, eats. I would also say it's often a reverse ugly duckling tail. Here's the adult. It's kind of cool. Far outshined in my estimation by this beautiful larvae that becomes the moth uh, with that blue tail. And it almost looks like it's lit from within. Here's a walnut sphinx, almost a specialist. It eats mostly walnut, but it'll eat some other things as well on a walnut tree pinkish cast to it, but it's caterpillar. You can't even make this stuff up. The caterpillar hisses like a snake. Snake mimicry is not that rare with some of the larger caterpillars. And caterpillars have rows of air exchange holes down the side. They're called spiracles. This one can force air out of those with such velocity, it makes this audible, loud hiss like a snake. And at the same time, the caterpillar thrashes violently. And that's a bird defense for sure. That might be enough to spook off a little chickadee that might want to eat it. 
Uh, there's a lot we don't know about Mazo, an awful lot that we don't know. Uh, I'll have some other examples of that, but this is uh, one close to home, the oyster shell, this beautiful little white moth with orange eyes, and it turned up at a recent Mothapalooza. If you don't know what Mothapalooza is, just Google it. It's an event that started here in Ohio. It's in its 10th year, and um, 200 people nearly come for a weekend of mothing. It's really cool. Anyway, where we moth a palooza now, this showed up and it was new to all of us. People with a lot of experience with moths. Well, it turns out its only host plant is leatherwood, Durca palustris. Leatherwood is not a very common shrub. It tends to be very colonial and very isolated. And uh, it's right behind where we have our sheets, where we catch the oyster shells, the nut not falling far from the tree, as it were. <clears throat> There's a, always a crowd pleaser when one of these comes into a moth sheet, the Cecropia. It's our largest regularly occurring moth in this part of the world, and as big as a big bat, maybe bigger than a lot of bats. <clears throat> Very impressive, and as you would expect, its caterpillar is equally impressive, armed with those colored spiny um, fascicles. Regal moth is another example of a wonderful silk moth, another whopper that always causes a stir when one comes into a sheet. Its caterpillar cannot be believed, though. It's called a hickory horn devil. This is not that rare where the caterpillar goes by a different name than the moth it becomes, regal moth in this case, hickory horn devil for the larvae. This animal, you can hear it crunching the walnut foliage five feet away or the hickory foliage. It is a big animal. It's often likened to a hot dog, hot dog sized caterpillar. And everyone's like, sure it is. <laughs> there you go. No caterpillar was harmed in the making of that photo, by the way. The imperial moth, this is another wonderful moth, a uh, big silk moth that people really like with just a wonderful caterpillar. It's really big, eats maple, really likes maples, but it'll eat a number of woody plants. And then one of the true holy grails of the moth world right there. This is the Harris's three spot that is bizarre. At certain angles, it looks just like a spider, a very strange looking thing. There it is from the back. Just a weird angle. It looks like a little Dracula with an orange hat on to me. And then the crazy caterpillar. So for those of us that hunt caterpillars, and believe me, there are people that hunt caterpillars. You got to go out at night mostly because they're nocturnal in general. But this is a total holy grail in the caterpillar world. Um, by turns, it looks like a fresh bird dropping. If you look at it from certain angles, the caterpillar is very spiderish. But what really stands out are those old head capsules retained on those stiff hairs above the head. Caterpillars grow by molts. Each stage in between a molt is called an instar. Five is a really common number of instars or molts, uh, and that's what this has. So for the last three or four molts, it retains those old head capsules, which are really hard, like a football helmet. One of the biggest threats to a caterpillar are parasitoid insects. These are insects that kill them by laying eggs on them, wasps and flies. The egg hatches, the grub bores into the caterpillar and they get eaten alive. They're a super common fate. When this feels one of those land on it, it flails them with the old football helmets and whacks them off of the body. Well, it's not surprising we don't see more moths. You have to make a bit of an effort for this. And one of the big reasons is crypsis, camouflage. They blend in remarkably well. This is a gray patch prominent, doing its best to imitate a broken off stub of a branch. And it's doing a really good job. Even a sharp-eyed titmouse might not see that. This probably takes it one step better because the white blotch heterocampa is dappled with greenish that mimics um, algal formations that are common on, on wood. Then there's this, you go look at a rosy maple moth and it looks like a Lepidopteran Teletubby. It's bright pink and yellow. This is not a common color scheme in nature because you stick out like a sore thumb. So after the crypsis that I just showed you, that's very effective, why would you look like this? This is a common moth, by the way, in our region. That's probably why this is a rosy maple moth on uh, the freshly emerged Samaras or fruit of a red maple, and it just mirrors the coloration to a perfection. 
this is a personal favorite moth, the spotted apatolodes. This is another very common species, probably for everyone that's listening to this virtually uh, in our region. <clears throat> and they look really cool like that, but this is in context of its habitat. It's a leaf litter specialist, not as a caterpillar, but as an adult. They roost in the leaf litter. The two moths on the right are angel moths, another leaf litter specialist. So many moths and many other animals, I'm just talking about moths though, so many moths are utterly dependent on leaf litter. Leaf, leaves have been falling off trees for well over 100 million years. So much of our insect communities have evolved to adapt and live in the leaf litter. So moths, they, their cocoons are often in leaf litter, sometimes eggs or many caterpillars that eat detritus, leaf litter, and many myriad moths that roost in it. So if this ever came to the ballot, it would get my vote to ban these leaf blowers because when you leaf blow in the wrong places, maybe on turf grass, it's probably not gonna do that much harm, but when it's done in areas like garden beds, I would never leaf blow in a garden bed. Anywhere under trees, you know, where leaf litter naturally falls, it, it causes an enormous swath of destruction. So in the region covered by our book, I showed you that map, <clears throat> We think there could be more than 10,000 species of moths. No one knows. There's no way to know. And in large part, this is due to the uh, micro moths, the micro moths, really tiny ones that are very, very poorly known. Lots being discovered there. So it's a lot of moths. Let's just put it that way. Butterflies in Ohio, I'm just using my own state as an example. This will hold true throughout the Midwest. Uh, we, we have 140 species roughly that have ever been found. Uh, Night and Cloud includes the one-offs and real rarities. So the moths are just overwhelmingly dwarfing the butterflies in this far north. Here's an example from our book. We profiled Diane Quatco Brook. She lives in Southeast Ohio on 12 and a half acres. And for that part of the world, it's very ordinary habitat, you know, wooded, um, mostly uh, just like you would see everywhere down there. But Diane has been mothing for over a decade now intensely, like every night it gets over 50 degrees on her property. And to date, th that number's from the book, 1,464. It's now 1,470. I just ran into her. Uh, 1,470 moth species on 12 and a half acres. She's into butterflies. She's only found 46 in that same time. <clears throat> so what do they all do? This is a question that a lot of people ask me. I'm glad they do ask me um, because they're curious. So you're saying, let's save moths or do things for moths, but why? People always want to know that. Well, here's why they carpet bomb with eggs. This was on my old house on, near the front door and that salt marsh female moth on the left laid all those eggs in short order. There's about 700 of them, 700 eggs. And she probably laid more elsewhere for all I know. That's the male on the right. Uh, that's uh, that level of fe reproductive fecundity, you know, prolific reproduction can tell you one thing for sure. They're getting eaten. The predatorial gauntlet is extreme. You have to do this to get a couple of those back through all the predators that want to eat you to the reproductive stage. Whales don't have to do this. Black bears don't have to do this. They're far too protective of those offspring. It's not true. You're an egg, you're on your own and, and everything wants to get you as we'll see. So just a little entomology 101. I chose a large egg so we can see it better. Moths, like butterflies, have a perfect metamorphosis, a four-part life cycle, and we'll just start with the egg. Um, the dark eggs are little caterpillars coiled up in there. You can see an egg where they've already, one's eaten his way out. This is within, I don't know, 10 minutes from hatching the first stem star, and you would not recognize that as a caterpillar probably with your naked eye, no matter how good your eyes are. It's only about two or three millimeters in length, so they start out really, really tiny. And then to jump to another species to show the molts that I already talked about, this is a black wave flannel moth, but you can really see the radical difference between molts. The white stuff on the left side is the old skin. Uh, it looked completely different in the penultimate instar. And then the last instar is the one on the right where it's completely changed form and gotten much, much bigger. This is how caterpillars grow.
is through these molds emerging bigger each time. Here's the third, back to the hickory horn devil. This is the uh, third instar now, and you wouldn't miss it. It's a big caterpillar at this point. It's going to get a lot bigger, as we saw, but um, it coils up on a leaf in plain sight. It's mimicking uh, dead plant debris. This is a really common strategy with caterpillars. And what it really looks like a lot are the old walnut flowers that are in racemes and they fall on the leaves and then dry and curl up. That's very similar to what the caterpillar looks like. Could be what's going on there. When it hits the penultimate end star, now you're not going to miss it uh, because it's so big. I saw that actually moving in my car in a hickory tree and uh, <laughs> stopped and photographed it, but it's got that one more stage, which we already saw a photo in the hot dog bun. And uh, by now it's growing tens of thousands in times, probably in biomass from that little uh, first instar right out of the egg. And then it becomes that gorgeous moth. So very few organisms on earth probably uh, increase as much in biomass as caterpillars do. This is my co-author's photo and it's an amazing photo of a tobacco hornworm uh, second instar on top of a uh, fully grown one. The first instar would have been maybe a third that size or less than that possibly. So you can see there the dramatic change over time. I want to stay on that tobacco hornworm. Uh, people erroneously call them tomato hornworms. That's a different species, but it's the tobacco hornworm that eats your tomatoes. Uh, and I know some of you listening have probably dispatched a few of these to save your tomatoes. Well, they're a native species and they eat our native nightshades. When we brought this non-native nightshade over, they took a shine to that and they'll move in and eat them as well, but it's a really valuable moth. Um, I would let some of your tomato plants uh, be sacrificed to this amazing moth. Here's what it becomes. It's a, a big hummingbird-like moth, really big if it makes it, and long proboscis. You, this one's on a non-native four o'clock, but you can see how elongate that proboscis is to plumb the nectaries. Well, these big sphinx moths and smaller ones, they play an important role in pollination. Uh, maybe most notably with our orchids. Um, this is one of the rarest orchids in the Midwest, the prairie white fringed orchid. It's federally threatened and sphinx moths are its only known pollinator. And I wanted to see this with my own eyes. So I got permission to stake out a population after dark and uh, voila, right after dusk, it, uh, in comes this wraith out of the darkness and plumbed every flower on my plant and the ones around it. It's a tobacco hornworm, the same one that eats your tomato plants. Look how long that um, tongue has to be, the proboscis. The orchids are often armed with what are called nectar spurs, a long greenish tube, and the nectar reward is way in the base. So you have to be able to hover in front of the flower and have an enormous proboscis to reach down in there and get it. In the process, uh, pollinia, pollen sacs from the orchid will stick to your tongue and you take them to a new plant. Here's another example. This is a more, much more obscure orchid, the tubercle rain orchid. All the leaves in that woods on the left, that what woods are it. There's a flower spike on the right. It also has little nectar spurs. And Chelsea and I, my co-author, happened to be there and we noticed what appeared to be dozens, if not hundreds, of, of little mosquitoes flying all around the plants. Well, they weren't mosquitoes. They were little tiny great plume moths. And they were clearly um, taking nectar from the plants. And then Chelsea got this amazing photo of a pollinia, a pollen sac from that orchid, stuck to the uh, proboscis of one of these tiny little great plume moths, you know, proving the pollination of this. A little, another little aside, I'm sorry, I like these little asides uh, on things. That little moth I just showed you is a specialist of grape. Uh, wild grapes do not get their due. Foresters will tell you to cut them out. They're damaging to your trees, all this other nonsense. Uh, they're all native. We have about, you know, in Ohio, at least six species, six, eight species, and they punch way over their weight in moth production. Um, lots and lots of specialists that only eat grape. And that gets to this better living through chemistry thing. This is why native flora is uh, not just important, it's critical to moths. Uh, they have this long chemical connection to the native flora and they've evolved the ability to eat all these compounds that plants produce. A lot of the reason 
plants produce chemical compounds is to thwart herbivory. And a big part of that herbivory is caterpillars. Uh, so it's this chemical warfare that wages over the eons, you know, where the caterpillars are always evolving the ability to assimilate this. Most cannot. So most plants can effectively repel most caterpillars, but some always crack the chem chemical code and can eat it. So there's this great specificity to native flora. When you introduce things like this daylily or other Eurasian plants, uh, they're often uh, absent in caterpillars or at least very, very low because just almost nothing can eat them. They're not co-evolved with that set of chemistry with those plants. Um, <clears throat> specialization due to chemicals is really common. It's much more common in the moth world than generalists are. This is a good example that's easy to find. Dogbane tiger moth uh, only eats dogbane. Dogbane's the milkweeds are a subset of the dogbane family and they have that milky latex that often is rich in cardiac glycosides. It's really toxic stuff and uh, not most moth caterpillars can't handle it, but this one can, that's all it eats. As opposed to a generalist, this, these are much rarer than the specialists in the moth world. This is a hickory tussock moth that can eat well, probably several, several hundred species of plants, but that's the exception. The former was the rule. So the caterpillar phase is often the longest actively mobile part of this life four part life cycle as far outliving the adult moths they become in many cases like the silk moths. And it is a beautiful world. It's a fascinating world when you get out there. Now I said this before, but you got to go out at night. Most of them hide very well during the day, largely probably to avoid bird predation. Most birds are diurnal. Uh, so this army emerges at night and you have to be out there then to find them. Um, and a blacklight flashlight is very helpful, UV flashlight, because a lot of them fluoresce purple under that. It makes them a lot easier to find. That looks like it just came off of a coral reef somewhere. This is one of the uh, myriad oak specialists, again, the red humped oakworm. Uh, could win a larval beauty pageant, but this one even more so. This is a specialist on honey locust moth. And Boy, is it a pretty caterpillar, big one too. So their tube stakes on legs. This is the, one of the major things about moths is um, the caterpillar phase because they are such easily digestible protein for so many things. The mortality rate can be extreme, at least in some species, like nearly 99%. You know, that's why they're laying all those eggs to survive that gauntlet. Gauntlet that uh, is full of interesting creatures. This is a big beetle, really showy, the uh, caterpillar hunter that runs around trees at night. It's nocturnal hunting caterpillars with those big mandibles. Here's a bird dropping, or so you would think. It's on a redbud leaf, and if we move around to the front of it, you see, no, it's not a bird dropping at all. It's this very Buddha-like spider. It looks, you know, his little legs, her legs tucked around her head that looks like she's wearing a crown. This is one of the most interesting spider groups, in my opinion. This is a toad-like boa spider. Boa spiders are a group. There are a number of species. And during the day, they hide in plain sight, mimicking bird droppings, because many, many things do this, uh, because apparently nothing wants to eat a bird dropping. But at night, the magic happens. I went back to this one after dark when we found this, and there it is. It's dropped down on it. It doesn't make a web. It just drops down on a little silken trellis and dangles that uh, dewdrop off of like a fishing line. And the dewdrop is very, very sticky. From the body, the, moth, the spider secretes pseudo pheromones that exactly mirror those of a small group of geometric moths, inchworm moths. And the males, you know, they're finding their females through pheromone cues, so they're duped by this, and they fly in ever closer, and when they get close enough to the spider, she whips that thing out like a bolus and sticks it, reels it in, and eats it. I mean, you can't even make this stuff up. But there are myriad other predators that go after caterpillars, and probably the, uh, maybe the most ominous group, if you want to put it that way, if you're a caterpillar, are the parasitoid flies and wasps. Parasitoids kill their hosts. Parasites generally don't. 
So this is a little tech hinted fly in the bottom waiting her opportunity to get at the unhaired underbelly of the salt marsh caterpillar where she can stick eggs right to the skin. If she can do that, that caterpillar is doomed. This is an incredibly common fate. When you hunt caterpillars, you see tech hinted fly uh, pupae or, on, on, or the old egg shells on the victims and it's too late by then these little grubs have already bored directly into the caterpillar and they're eating it alive it's a walking dead caterpillar if you will uh, not going to make it through the life cycle incredibly common um wasp get them too wasp get them a lot of cool ways this is a more active hunter a thread wasted wasp with the saddled prominent cat that far outweighs that that powerful wasp She's dug a crypt a, a few feet away, pre-made crypt in the sand. She paralyzed the caterpillar with a punishing neurotoxin. So it's not dead, just disabled. She will seal it into the crypt, lay an egg in there, and then seal it up. And that way, when the wasp grub hatches, it has fresh meat, living meat. I hope they're not consciously aware of what's going on to them, because that would be no way to go. Uh, this is more of an endoparasitoid that's very common, like those tachinid flies I showed you. This is a, a specialist on Catalpa sphinx caterpillars, uh, Cortesia congregata. Very common to see this on this species of caterpillar, but uh, Braconid, the Braconidae, which is an enormous family of very tiny wasps, are big parasitoids of caterpillars laying their eggs. Same old story, being eaten alive, but in this case, they burst from the skin of the uh, shriveled but still living husk, like that movie Alien or something. And then after a day or so, the uh, adult wasps pop out of those cocoons to start the life cycle anew. This fate we wouldn't wish on anyone. This could be, I think, the scariest of all. This is a dark banded owlet that got victimized by a cordyceps fungus or a relative of that. They call it zombie fungus. So airborne spores got on this moth. Somehow they worm their way into the victim. Then fungal hyphae start uh, growing throughout the innards of the moth and cleverly leaving it alive as long as possible, but consuming much of the innards. And as a last hurrah, they somehow rewire the victim to go up into a area that's exposed to breezes, a prominent spot like where I found this one. Um, and then the, the hyphae shoot from the body and the spores are released from the tips of the hyphae to start this anew. If this effort jumps into people, it ain't gonna be fun times, believe me. Um, so anyway, as I said, they are tube stakes on legs. Um, lots of stuff getting them. I'm gonna talk about some more of those here in a second that more people could relate to. But one of the big things about moth caterpillars is they're taking all that plant life out there and they're converting it to digestible protein for so many other animals that don't eat plants. Um, so really all your birds, everything else is growing directly from foliage. There's just this agent in between an interface and that's the caterpillars taking that and putting it in a form that things like this can eat. That's a red-eyed vireo. Uh, cocking his head because he's looking up at the underside of a leaf because during the day a lot of cats hide under the leaves and he knows it and this is a caterpillar specialist all the vireos are they're related to shrikes and they have a little hooked bill tip and they uh, are very good at ripping open caterpillars that they find this is one of the most common breeding birds in eastern deciduous forest in ohio alone this would be true of all your states in the east um about 1 million red-eyed vireos seasonally occupy Ohio, coming from the uh, South American um, Andes, slopes of the Andes, Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, places like that where they winter, come all the way up here to exploit the seasonal bounty of caterpillars, and they do it well. Very conservatively, those 1 million red-eyed vireos in Ohio are eating 30 million caterpillars a day. This is one bird species after all the insects that we just saw. It's amazing. This is another caterpillar specialist. So is its relative, the black-billed cuckoo. And cuckoos, um, they're even nocturnal. You hear them sing at night a lot throughout the night. And that's because the caterpillars are nocturnal and they're undoubtedly uh, out there hunting them on their own terms. And they like big caterpillars. That's a big robin plus sized bird. 
but everyone likes warblers. Warblers are one of the most popular groups of songbirds, and we wouldn't have them were it not for moths spawning all these caterpillars. This is a worm-eating warbler, which is horribly misnamed. It's a caterpillar-eating warbler. It specializes in extracting caterpillars from hanging dead leaf clusters. This is a Nashville warbler in migration along Lake Erie on its way to the boreal forest of Canada that would have wintered in Central America, extracting a caterpillar from a bivouac that it made in grapes, wild grape foliage. Here's our smallest Eastern warbler, the Northern Perula, that has a little inchworm. This is an early one to arrive, mid-April. Beautiful synchronicity with the initial blush of uh, caterpillars coming out as the foliage starts to appear. The birds are right there to capitalize. This one I took in Shawnee State Forest in Southern Ohio, and that's a cerulean warbler, a bird of conservation concern. 80% of the population has disappeared in the last 50 years. It's an oak specialist, forest management in general has not been kind to this species. That's a big part of the problem. And they depend on caterpillars as well. This one has an ashen pinion, which is weird because that's one of the only carnivorous caterpillars that will eat other caterpillars, getting this karmic payback from the bird. Well, that same day I took that shot, there were Quaker moth caterpillars hanging everywhere. A lot of caterpillars during the day will hang on a little silken belay line because they're probably safer just out in the air than up on a leaf where the vireo might spot them. Uh, and they have boom and bust years. So this natural cycling is, is really a normal thing where boom and bust years of prey populations, caterpillars in this case, really influence maybe cerulean warblers from year to year. A lot of cats one year, High reproductive success, more cerulean warblers crash the next year. Just a natural yo-yoing of things. Uh, even good vegans, uh, like this song sparrow, and most sparrows are very vegan for most of the year, when they have little nests of chicks that need a lot of protein to grow, actively growing, they have no compunction about harvesting cats. This one's got a bill full of prominent caterpillars and nest about 15 feet away. They're all gonna get stuck down into little chicks to help them grow. But it doesn't end with birds. I mean, on we go. So you all know the food chain, right? The ecological webs that spawn. And if you're any of those birds I just showed you, you don't want those faces looking at you because Cooper's hawks, you know, more or less directly are fed by plants, spawning caterpillars that grew songbirds that they specialize on to eat. So on it goes, never ends. Well, bats are popular these days, which is a good thing. I can remember when they weren't nearly as beloved as they are. Part of this is because they're declining like crazy because of white nose syndrome and other factors as well. Habitat loss always overarching everything. Uh, but we wouldn't have bats in this part of the world were it not for moths. Moths are the major prey item for them, followed by beetles probably. And in Ohio, probably Tennessee has some more species, but about a dozen species of bats. Well, they love to eat moss. Um, they like these big ones too. A lot of big French fry in the middle of something like this Luna moth. That's a male with uh, those huge antennae that are uh, loaded with the pheromone receptors. And that's how she finds a female. The airborne pheromones released by a female can be detected by the male from at least a half a mile away, maybe a mile away. It's hard to say. The rub is they have to then fly to that source and that gets them up in the air column and that's where the bats are. So they do, they've developed a way to try and thwart the bats. There's a lot of ecological warfare going along, uh, on here, evolutionary warfare between bats and moths. So when people see a fresh luna like that, the tail streamers always stand out to them and they always comment on those and it's like, why? Well, you know, it helps it blend in when it's at rest like that. That's probably not the primary reason. The primary reason is to thwart bats, like this little red bat roosting in a beech tree during the day. Uh, bats, is, as everyone knows, use sonar. They have echolocation. They're pinging sound waves out into the air, and it's bouncing off and back to them. And a specialized organ in their ears called a tragus uh, tells it remarkably accurately how far that object is. It's a really sophisticated sonar. Well, in the case of the Luna moth, the sonar pings off those rapidly rustling tails, which they do inflate. They wave and it attracts the sonar's attention. And you often see Lunas that look like that. 
So it worked. You know, the tails are missing parts of the wings, but the bat missed the uh, stake in the middle. And this Luna can still reproduce if it will. This has been shown in laboratories, by the way, that it's exactly what's going on there. This one I saw with my own eyes. It's a polyphemus moth, another huge silk moth. And it entered a sphere of lights one night and there was a bat hot on its heels. And all those bites that you see out of the wings, those were made within like two to three minutes of me making that photo. The, this moth has just evolved a crazily erratic yo-yo flight. It just makes it really hard to hit the way it flies. And it worked in this case. It doesn't always work, but uh, it certainly ups the odds. Some moths will fall from the sky. Moths have ears. They hear very well. When they hear the echolocation of a bat getting too near, they just drop to the ground their last ditch effort to save themselves. Lots of weird stuff happening, but probably none as weird as this. This is a really common tiger moth in our, our part of the world, the dogbane tiger moth. And it's not this species, but very similar ones, or at least one for sure, produces pseudo echolocation. So when the moth is flying, it hears the bat closing in. When it gets to a certain point, the moth releases a, a a uh, barrage of clicks, really loud clicks, and jams the sonar of the bat. And that screws up the bat's ray, uh, sonar, and it shoots right by the victim and, and misses it. Um, lots of weird warfare between that group. But um, they bats still get a lot of them, and we wouldn't have bats were it not for their moth food sources. This is really true of this big group of, or small group of birds for us, known as night jars, sometimes called goat suckers. Uh, the best known example probably is the whippoorwill. <clears throat> this is one at roost during the day. But again, uh, just like with the bats, moths are their uh, major food source, the biggest group of insects by far, which they fly catch out of the air, very good at finding them and getting them. And whippoorwills have declined a lot, tremendously in most of the range. And, uh, the m decline in moth populations and habitat. You cannot never have these discussions without mentioning habitat loss, but these factors have uh, undoubtedly are the major contributor to whippoorwill declines. This is its bigger brother, the chuckwills widow. It's even bigger. These are so big that their gape, uh, the mouth, when it's open fully, you could put your fist in there. They're known to eat hooded warblers for <laughs> other songbirds, but they eat, mostly they want those big silk moths and larger moths, and that's what they do. This one's on a nest, two eggs, right on leaf litter. There is no nest, it's just on the leaf litter. And if you can't really see what's going on, there's some parts of the bird. It's frame filling the whole picture. Wonderful camouflage, just like a lot of the moths that they eat. So I wanted to end with this though. Uh, moths as pollinators, they obviously play an enormous role in that probably far more than butterflies could ever hope to do, um, abetted by their fuzzy bodies. Many moths have fuzzy bodies. Pollen sticks to them really well. Um, our book, we have, uh, this is no effort to sell the book here, but we, ha we have a lot of plants in there, some really cool stuff too, 150 natives um, that we profile and all the moths that use them and uh, other little recipes to use plants for moths, but uh, essentially the, the plants that are really good for butterflies during the day that you can easily see, if you go back to those after dark with a flashlight, then you'll see the moth prey. This is common milkweed, which is really, really a heavy hitter for moth pollination with a spotted grass moth. There's a bold feathered grass moth on common milkweed. Milkweeds are always good for finding moths at night. White flowers in general seem to be really good. It's possible that white is sort of an evolution to attract moths at night, shows up better. That's a celery, celery leaf deer on button bush. Uh, some do fly during the day. This is a firefly mimic, no doubt. It's really similar to fireflies. Fireflies have some nasty alkaloids in them that maybe birds don't want to eat. That could be the reason, who knows? But this is on mist flower uh, and it's in the Asteraceae, the sunflower family. The sunflower family are really good moth plants in general. This is from the cover of the book. This was taken in a garden. These were planted, but it's a native, culver's root. If you ever see culver's root for sale, get it. It's this big four to five foot tall statuesque spike-like wands of white flowers and man, do the moths love it. Uh, including the conchalotes there. Uh, monardas are really good. This is wild bergamot. 
uh, very common, super easy to grow, and that's a cutworm moth. So the chemist, chemical industry has got us, you know, convinced that cutworms are really bad because the caterpillars eat turf grass. I'm like, more power to the caterpillars, but they will eat turf grass. They eat, of course, mostly other things, but cutworms are really valuable. So these, you want these native cutworms. They're all native. You want them around. And one reason is the Eastern bluebirds. They love cutworm moths. Many of you have seen a bluebird sitting on a fence post or whatever, and then it, it like a little raptor dives into the grass and comes out with something. It's often a cutworm. So cutworms equal bluebirds. So I'm going to end with this, and this is one of many of these sorts of things in our book, but <clears throat> excuse me, it's a simple recipe to grow some very cool moths. They're very easy to garden for, more interesting than gardening for butterflies, in my opinion. So everyone likes these because we can see them during the day. They're sphinx moths known as clear wings. And this is a snowberry clear wing, uh, type of hummingbird moth, if you will. And it's on wild bergamot. Clear wings love bergamot. Uh, fascinating little animals. And here's its slightly bigger brother, the hummingbird clear wing moth. This is on tall larkspur. Another plant, if you ever see this for sale, snap it up. It is amazing. These can get five feet tall with all those racemes of beautiful flowers. But the, the, the clearwing moth, hummingbird moths, they hover just like hummingbirds, converge in evolution. They're sort of after the same thing. They've evolved the same ways to get to that nectar. And you will get them if they're around and you have those flowers in your garden. They will come. But you have to grow the caterpillars to have the moth, as we all know by now, at least. And they have certain groups of plants that they like. Here's the hummingbird, uh, the one I just showed you. It's caterpillar, very beautiful caterpillars, bearing the telltale sphinx caterpillar tail, like a terrier dog. And here's the snowberry clearwing, the first one I showed you. But they are specialists mostly, not completely, but mostly on honeysuckles, the Caprifoliaceae. The honeysuckle family has gotten tarnished in recent times by all these invasive bush honeysuckles, Japanese honeysuckle, all that. But we have some really wonderful ones that are native and should be in the garden and viburnums might lead the pack. Uh, this is my personal favorite viburnum, arrowwood. It's really easy to grow, very showy uh, in flower and produces wonderful berries and the birds like to eat the berries. So it's a double whammy in the sense that you're helping birds as well. But the caterpillars of those two moths love these. They love this. This is the wild honeysuckle, sometimes called dwarf honeysuckle, dire villa. Another one, if you see it, snap it up. Easy to grow, forms these showy little shrubs and those caterpillars love it. And this is the flashiest of all. This is our native trumpet honeysuckle. It'll be very common in Tennessee, I would think. Uh, barely gets to Ohio, but uh, has those really showy flowers, often pretty much all summer long, and the caterpillars like to eat that as well. So you grow these plants, you grow the caterpillars, the hummingbird clearwing moss, have the proper nectar plants in your garden. You got the whole package. That whole life cycle will evolve right in your, your yard. As a, a bonus of that honeysuckle I just showed you, ruby-throated hummingbirds are absolutely smitten with it. It might It's a, pretty much specialized for humming, hummingbirds too, to help pollinate in addition to the moths. So um, there you go. There's a simple little recipe. It's very easy to do this stuff. So gardening with native floor, I think I've hopefully more than made my case on that, but it's gonna produce way, way more biodiversity of native animals than non-native flora would ever hope to do. Uh, but the biggest one might be that fourth point. You can read these for yourself. I'm not gonna read them, but uh, it creates a footprint beyond your yard. You've essentially made your yard a much bigger place now because you're <clears throat> sending organisms out beyond your yard that are gonna go do good things. and. Uh, just as Doug, Doug Talmy is the best at getting this message out for sure. But um, if if a lot of us would do this, the diversity, biodiversity would increase tremendously. The world would be a much, much better place. Okay, that's it. Thank you.
Wow. Thank you so much, Jim. That was an incredible presentation. And um, I, I just can't believe how cute some of those moths are. <laughs> yeah, they are definitely cute. That's adorable. We have um, a few questions. I think Monica might want to start with one of her questions and then we'll get with some uh, audience questions. Yeah, first of all, I wanted to ask you suggesting some uh, moth magnets, but you covered it so beautifully with native plants. Uh, I was very happy to hear that many of the plants that you mentioned are actually in our seed mix, like all the sunflower, the milkweed, the wild bergamot. I also want to mention that our the Tennessee Tree Day program covers many of the trees and shrubs that you mentioned. So if people buy trees or shrubs or get trees and shrubs from us, uh, they would definitely feed uh, the moss species. So that was fascinating. Um, I wanted to ask you if, if there is a one moth that you are most fascinated about or you are most excited to find because it's so endangered or threatened? Yeah, good question. That's kind of like picking your favorite bird. My usual answer is whatever one I'm looking at at the time, but uh, I, I do have a favorite moth and it's a obscure species. It doesn't even have a common name I can think of, but it's Begasara gaunari and it's what got me interested in moths when I was uh, collecting plants, I probably have 10,000 sheets, plant specimens out in various academic or barrier, you know, and back in those days, I collected a rare plant called glade mallow, went to the office to make the specimen, there was this big green caterpillar on it, and I didn't, I just figured it was a rare caterpillar because the plant was so rare that it was on. An entomologist raised it for me, a miracle, it wasn't parasitized, but, and he called me up one day, he goes, you'll never believe this. It's the third record ever of this moth and the first one for Ohio. We knew nothing about it. No one knew the host plant. Now we know the host plant. And since then, we've gone out to patches of glade mallow and easily find the caterpillars. You know, it just shows, and it's a big, impressive inchworm caterpillar. It just shows there's just so much we don't know about these that are out there. The adult moss no slouch either, but that has a special place to me just because it really exposed me to the world of moss. Yeah, fantastic. And it's also interesting for how many moths we don't know what is the host plant still, right? Oh yeah, that's there's still a lot of mystery about that. Um, it's very common one will come into a sheet, we're like, hey, what is this? And we dig around, no one knows the host plant, it's unknown. So lots of work to be done here. Hey, yes. Jeff, are you popping your camera on? Um, oh, sure, I'm sorry, I forgot. Question and answer, thank you so much. Okay, it's boring. Yeah. Hey, would you like to read up some of the questions that came in? Yeah, I will read. Um, question from Jim Webster tent caterpillars are used to be common sites are used to be common sites at wild cherry trees in Tennessee but he rarely sees them anymore do you have any insight on this no that's an interesting observation I've not heard that before um and haven't noticed it personally it's still very common it's cyclical like I mentioned in the talk it's a boom and bust thing some years there's not so many but overall i I, I don't know. That's a new observation to me. I'll, okay. I'll remember that though and watch. By the way, I want to say something though. Thanks, Jim, for the question because that caterpillar and then its fall, late summer counterpart, the fall webworm that forms even bigger nests and lots of kinds of trees, people hate these things. I mean, I've heard of people taking blow torches out there to melt these out of the trees. They're native and cuckoos love them. Cuckoos absolutely love them and they extract them from those nests and Baltimore Orioles love them too and can deal with those spiny caterpillars and eat them. So they're doing good things. Um, I had a question. Um, what time of night are moths most active if, if we wanna go out and spy on them? Uh, spy on them. Um, that's a really good question. Very insightful. This comes up, we did a mothing program, my co-author and I, uh, a few nights ago and uh, with the general public, by 10 o'clock or so, 11, certainly, people are wanting to go. People are not night owls. We're not programmed that way generally. The magic is just starting. So you will get stuff coming in right after dusk. And when I say mothing, 
I didn't explain this, but we're putting uh, bright lights on white sheets, you know, a moth to a flame, basically. But the magic really doesn't open up until after midnight. So here's a really common strategy. You moth until about one in the morning. You might run out of steam. Uh, then you set your alarm and go back out at 4.30 in the morning. And it can be insane how much more, especially the big silk moths. They're often the late night shift, early morning shift. And then once we check everything at 4.30, we brush the, turn the lights off, brush the sheet, brush them all back out into the woods so the titmice and chickadees don't have a field day when the sun comes up. Oh, very cool. I will have to set my alarm. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we have a question from uh, Allison. Uh, does coral berry have a specific moths? Yeah, good question. Coral berry is a honey honeysuckle, and if it's here's where things get a little wonky. Here, I try and avoid the this in the talks, but Symphora carpos albus, variety albus. So this is really important. Like whenever I tell people to what native plants to get, we always have the scientific name. So this is crystal clear because common names are all over the map. There's a non-native variety of that that's commonly sold, I believe, at least uh, for gardens. And you want that native one. Mm -hmm. And the the coral, the snowberry clearwing at the end, the little hummingbird moth, that's what it's named for. So okay. absolutely, those hummingbird moths will eat that, the native one. Right. Um. Let's see. Uh, Allison has a question again about, um, please explain why zappers at night are good or bad uh, for managing mosquitoes. Ooh, I've never been asked that. Thanks, Allison. So I'm, I'm like thinking, in general, I don't much care for the idea of just killing insects wantonly. Um, but I've never had a zapper, so I have no experience with them. I imagine they're um, not specific to mosquitoes. <laughs> Anything that flies in there, if there's a light near them, moths are probably getting zapped. I don't know. I don't know. I really just beyond my pay grade on that. I would say in terms of mosquito spraying, that's more clear cut. Guy was just parked down the street yesterday. I say I wanted to tell him, man, don't you make an appearance near my yard with this spray stuff. Mosquito yeah. on the side of the truck. A lot of that, I believe, is not specific to mosquitoes. Uh, this used to be and still is a problem with gypsy moth spring because it's not selective uh, to other moths. And you can imagine the nuclear Armageddon fallout from gypsy moth spring where it's killing all Lepidoptera. That's an ecological, ecological catastrophe. So uh, chemicals, I think it's more clear cut. I don't know about the zappers. If it just hits mosquitoes, I don't know, I guess it's not as big an issue. Yeah, I've never I used emit some lights, and uh, that's why probably mosquitoes are also drawn to it. But I also don't have much experience with that. My neighbors um, spray for mosquitoes, and it's it's disappointing. Yeah, Just it's like I, I don't think it should be allowed because it's. I mean, there's not a magical invisible wall between yards. It's coming, it's like having a no urination zone in a swimming pool, I mean, or a no smoking corner of a room. It's going everywhere and uh, I I don't like it. I don't know, but it has abated. It's not as bad as it used to be, at least where I live. You don't see that very often anymore, which is a good thing. Yeah. yeah. Shall I go with the next question? So April Griffin asked if you could talk a little bit about the outdoor lights. Uh, she would like to know why they are, uh, moths are attracted to them. And it might be worth mentioning if it is helpful for moths to use motion activated lights or some other, I don't know. No, that's a good your question. Yeah. Uh, good question. Um, so what we use when we specially trap for them, and I, trap's not a good word. We're not killing them or anything, but luring them into a white sheet. I use a white shed wall in my backyard when I do it here. Anything white's good, but uh, mercury vapor light is probably the king. Mercury vapor. Mm -hmm. It's very bright, and it's got this frequency that really seems, or wavelength, is really attractive. And then it's very common to work that in tandem with a UV light, a tubular black light. And that sends off a completely different spectrum of light, it tends to attract other species. 
So between the two, you're going to do very well. Uh, halide light, I think this is right. Halide lights, they're very bright, easier to get and less expensive. They're, they're pretty effective as well. But basically, you just want a really bright white light source and a black light source and a white substrate. And you'll attract them. Uh, motion sensor lights probably don't do much at I all. Think she's, she's mean, she has a different meaning. I think she is uh, trying to say how outside lights attract moths and it's kind of a death trap, you know, not for mothing, not for um, sure. what you do collecting them, but uh, having outside and probably that's what she means that uh, having motion activated lights on it next to your front door mm -hmm. uh, will reduce the effect that moths are dying because of they get exhausted flying all night to the yeah oh i'm I, sorry I, I completely misunderstood that no she's exactly I, right on that that's that's what everyone should do keep the, but the great up. thing that we now answered two questions <laughs> yes it's uh, you know what i do around here anymore i i I don't turn any lights on. Electricity yeah. is getting more expensive too. Why? There's no real reason. I mean, there might be in certain areas where you feel safety from that, but in a lot of places, it's completely unnecessary to have all these lights on and there are death traps for moths. So no, the motion sensor idea, that's a really good solution. Um, do you know why moths are attracted to light? Good, I'm glad you asked that. We have a whole, little chapter in our book on that question. It is unresolved. So no, no one knows. There's several theories for this, uh, probably some combination thereof, but no one knows the exact answer for that. It's a bit of a mystery. And we laid it out in the book as to what people say about that. Hmm. So no, unknown. Interesting. Okay, hey, um, what is your opinion on people rearing moths as a hobby? Mm, I'm going to get myself in trouble here because <laughs> I just say what I think usually, but um, mixed feelings. So when you take an operation like the Caterpillar Lab, Google this sometime, Caterpillar Lab, that's Sam Jaffe up in New Hampshire. This is amazing. This is a wonderful reason to rear caterpillars because Sam is exposing so many people to the world of moths and caterpillars that it's worth it. What seems to be going on now, and this is where I probably have a little issue, is it's just become a hobby. Everyone, they, we catch these cool moths. Oh, can I have it? Especially if it's a gravid female, pregnant female, they want to raise the eggs and I, I just don't, it, they're not using them for educational purposes or anything. I, I'm starting to have a little issue with this because it seems to be getting really common. There are Facebook groups and just for this and all that. And you're basically taking them out of the gene pool unless you're releasing them later when they, I don't know, or putting the eggs back out if you can do that. But I, I, I don't know. I think the jury is still out on that. But I think there are some legitimate concerns that seem to be appearing with it. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I'm, I'm not a huge advocate probably yeah it seems like it might uh, you know maybe introduce some diseases there are diseases as well also uh with with the same issue with butterflies that when people have butterflies and um release them that they might actually cause larger problems uh with yeah disease. i think that could happen i know that uh, the monarch people had some issues with all the monarch raising for what disease I think there was a disease issue or something related to that and I'm not up on that so much but um yeah I I think it's only going to get more popular though uh, once people see these and how cool they are it's like a little magic show right in your porch you know where you see these things transform and go through all this process uh, but it's here to stay I think Okay, let's see if we have one more question. Um, uh, Karen is asking, our neighbor has a, a light to supposedly kill mosquitoes. Well, I think it's the same kind of question, kill mosquitoes, but I think he is just killing moths. I will use some of this info to ask him kindly to say, so it's a very, thank you very much. Yes, use this webinar, spread the words. 
uh, how to save moth species and turning off the lights mm. to uh, support them. Um, mm. I would like to have one question myself before we go on. Uh, we are a little over time now, but I think the questions are so interesting. I would like to keep on going. So just very quickly, one of the most important fall practice that we talk about and educate people is leaving the leaves. Mm -hmm. uh, the so-called leave the leaves. Uh, would you please emphasize why is it so important for, for moth species to keep the leaf litter uh, under the trees or save it? Uh, it's their habitat, plain and simple, and a very, very important facet of moth habitat. Um, like I mentioned in the talk, leaves, deciduous trees evolved, I think, pushing 200 million years ago. So leaves have been falling on the ground for a long, long time. And uh, moths especially have just developed this incredibly robust and intricate relationship with detritus, leaf litter. And when we destroy the leaf litter, we destroy myriad of larvae, cocoons, eggs in some cases, uh, resting habitat for moss, like those the patalodes that I showed in the talk. Um, you're just, they're laying waste to tremendous habitat full of living organisms that play a much bigger role beyond leaf litter. So that's a message that really needs to get, be gotten out there better. Save leaf litter wherever we can. Now, I, I just re want to emphasize, if it's on mowed turf grass, that's probably not that big an issue because there isn't much in the mowed turf grass anyway. We should get rid of that too. But uh, when it's in the garden beds or under trees, we should try and leave it. Yes, but I think also from the turf grass, if it falls, just bring it to your your garden, bring it under the trees, keep it there. Yeah. And you and also don't bag it up because those goes to compost companies and the heat is so much higher in composting company location that those moths will probably